let's take a look at what happens when we use a source with a triangular wave instead of a sinusoid. In this circuit, we're going to be finding the average power consumed in the load resistor if the frequency of this triangular wave is 100 Hz. We can't use RMS in order to find this power. The reason we can't use RMS is because of the inductor. The impedance of this inductor is J omega L. We can't just calculate the RMS voltage of this triangular wave, use voltage division, and then calculate the voltage across the load resistor. And the reason we can't do that is because the impedance of this inductor is J omega L. The fact that there's an omega in the inductance implies that there's only a single frequency. But a triangular wave doesn't have just a single frequency. It can be represented as a Fourier series, an infinite sum of many different sine waves, each at a different frequency and a different amplitude. Our strategy for solving this problem is going to be to decompose this triangular wave into its Fourier series, solve the circuit component by component or frequency by frequency, and then use superposition to sum up all of the voltages at the load resistor. I'm not going to derive the Fourier representation of a triangular wave, I'm just going to note it down. This is what the voltage looks like of this particular wave. I'm going to lump some of these constants together and just call the amplitude of each component V sub n. Likewise, I'm going to define omega sub n as being 2 pi n times our operating frequency here, which is 100 hertz in this particular problem. What this means is that our original source, which represented a triangular wave, can be represented instead as many different sine waves in series with one another. The impedance of our inductor is different for each source. Let's call the voltage across our load V sub L. Let's take a look at a few of these components so that we can see that yes, indeed, our triangular wave can be represented as a sum of various sine waves. Here's what it looks like with just the first component. Here's what it looks like with two components, three components, eight components, and 18 components. As you can see, with only 18 components, our series of sine waves resembles our triangular wave very closely. Of course, for it to be mathematically exact, the series has to go all the way to n equals infinity, but it looks quite good with only 18 terms in that series. I can represent the voltage across the load resistor as an infinite series. Each one of these components will be a voltage due to one of the sources. We can use phasor form to represent each of these sources. The voltage across the load for each component in will have both a magnitude and a phase. We'll use voltage division to calculate each of these components. The voltage at the load is just the voltage at the source times our voltage divider. Normally now I would write J omega L, but because the omega is a function of the in, I'm going to write J omega sub in times the inductance L. We now have everything on this view graph that we need to solve the problem. The problem asks us to find the average power consumed in the load resistor. So in order to find the average power, I'm going to find the time varying power over one period and take the average over one period. The formula for instantaneous power is V squared over R. So basically I'm just integrating over one period of the instantaneous power in order to calculate its average. You might recall that superposition can only be used to calculate things that are linear. So we can use superposition to calculate the voltage across the load resistor due to all of these sources which are in series with one another. But I can't use superposition, for example, to say that the power across the load resistor is the sum of the powers due to each of the sources which are in series with one another. Let's take a look at the n equals one source. My strategy first is to calculate the voltage across the load resistor due only to the n equals one source. Then we'll calculate the voltage across the load resistor due to the n equals 3 source. Then we'll find it due to the n equals 5, 7, 9, and so on. After we find all of these voltages due to each source, we can add them up in order to find the total voltage across the load resistor due to all of the sources. Once we have that formula for the voltage across the load resistor, I can find the instantaneous power, and from that I can calculate the average power, which is what the problem called for. We have here the voltage for our triangular wave, and you can see that the voltage for the n equals one source would just be 10 times eight over pi squared times the sine of omega t, because n equals one here. My impedance is just j omega l. 
Let's find the voltage across the load resistor in phasor form. I'm going to use voltage division, so we have our source voltage times the voltage divider. My operating frequency here is 100 Hz, and the inductance is 16 millihenries. This is just a complex number, so I can write it both in rectangular and polar form. Now that I have the voltage across the load resistor in phasor form, I can write it in the time domain as well. Let's take a look at what that looks like graphed out. Here we have the voltage across the load resistor, but we've truncated our infinite series, stopping at just the first term, so it's just a sine wave here. On the left side of this view graph, you can see a formula for the voltage across the load resistor that we've got plotted out. On the right, I've used this formula in order to calculate average power, truncating the series at the first term. The average power here is wrong, but as we include more and more terms, we should converge to the correct answer. Let's go ahead and calculate the voltage across the load resistor due to the n equals 3 source. The reason, by the way, why we don't have cosine sources, for example, is because our triangular wave had odd symmetry. If I had shifted our triangular wave to this position, then we could have represented it by an infinite series of cosines. If that triangular wave were shifted anywhere between these two positions, then you need both sines and cosines in order to represent it by its Fourier series. They would all give the same answer because we're interested here in calculating the average power, and the average power shouldn't depend on phase of the source. Let's proceed to find the voltage across the load resistor due to our n equals 3 source, given that we have odd symmetry here. Since n equals 3, our omega is effectively three times what it was with the n equals 1 source. The impedance of my inductor is thus j3 omega l instead of just j omega l like it was before. Let's again use voltage division to find the voltage across the load resistor in phasor form. There's the amplitude of our source, and here is our voltage divider. We can simplify that first term a little bit and then substitute in for both omega and l. What I have written down is just a complex number, so we can write it both in rectangular and polar form. Now that I have the voltage across the load in phasor form, I can just write it in the time domain as well. Let's combine this voltage that we've calculated due to the n equals 3 source with the voltage that we calculated before due to the n equals 1 source. When we add them up, we have a more faithful representation of the actual voltage across the load resistor. We only have two terms, and in order to do this with mathematical perfection, we would need an infinite number of terms. But I think that you can see that the more terms we have, the more closely our approximation for the voltage across the load resistor will resemble reality. Our formula for the voltage across the load resistor is a little bit more complicated than it was before. So in order to find the integral here, in order to calculate the average power, I've used Mathematica. The average power here is nearly 0.33 watts. As we add terms, you'll notice that this power changes, but that it converges the more terms we have in our series. Here's what it looks like if I include the n equals 5 source as well. We now have three terms in the series. Here's what it looks like with eight terms. And here's what it looks like with 18 terms. Adding more terms doesn't significantly change our calculation for the average power. It's still 0.33 watts. It doesn't change how the graph looks very much either. We could add more terms, but without seeing any difference and without any difference in the calculation, it's probably not worth it. What I hope that you've learned from this video is that if you have a periodic source or a periodic signal, no matter how complicated, you can always use its Fourier series to represent it in a circuit. With its Fourier decomposition, you can then calculate voltages everywhere in your circuit, provided that your circuit has linear circuit elements. Once you know the voltages everywhere in the circuit, even though their formulas might be complicated, you can then numerically find things like power. Although this procedure is complicated and a little bit messy, I hope that it's clear. This video is part of an organized sequence where I explore various AC and switching circuits. If you enjoyed it, then you might consider following the channel's playlist to learn more about these types of circuits.